All right, we're live now. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the 2015 Global Dialogue on Waste. We're proud uh, to be conducting our panel discussions consecutively for the third year to disseminate knowledge in waste management. As part of the 2015 Global Dialogue on Waste, we will host a panel discussion every Wednesday until the end of December this year. Our next panel will be on November 11th, and Zoe Lankovich will be moderating a panel on community engagement in waste management. You can learn more about the time and other details of all upcoming panels by following us on social media or by subscribing to our newsletter. We welcome you to join this conversation with your questions and comments. You can use the live chat window on our homepage or tweet to us at BeWasteWise. If you're watching this video after its live broadcast, you can find recordings of all our panel discussions on our website, www.wastewise.be. And um, finally, I, I'd like to uh, thank our panelists today. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Christian Zerberg from EWOG Sandic and um, Dr. Stephen Weiss from Ricardo Energy and Environment. Stephen Weiss has been um, with us on a different panel on RDF export uh, previously as a, in the 2015 Global Dialogue on and I thank him for joining us again. So um, thank you very much and let's get into the questions, um, uh, into the introduction, sorry. Um, uh, Christian, would you like to introduce yourself and then uh, tell us a little bit about your organization and what you're doing? Yes, thank you very much. Um, hello to everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Zerberg. I am an uh, environmental engineer by profession, uh, also with a background in geology. And um, I'm working at EABAC in a department called SANDEC, Water and Sanitation for Developing Countries. So as the name already mentions, we're, our focus is on the developing country context, so low-income, middle-income countries. And uh, my specific research is on solid waste management. That means mostly municipal solid waste management with a research focus on organic waste. Great, thank you. And um, Stephen? Thank you, Ranjith. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, I'm Stephen Wise. I'm a principal consultant with Ricardo Energy and Environment. Ricardo work with governments and the private sector across a range of environmental areas, including air quality, water, the environment, climate change, renewable energy, and the part that I work with, waste management and resource efficiency. I actually work uh, across the due diligence, risk management, and waste operations sectors, providing support to, to clients and helping identify and implement new solutions. Um, my background is very much within solid waste. Um, I've got a, an engineering doctorate uh, with, which looked at anaerobic digestion and composting of wastewater. So it's come very much from, from this biological background and fits very well with what Ranjit is, is panels talking about today. Great. Um, uh, thank you. And um, today um, uh, we have um, Chris uh, who will be talking mostly about the developing country perspective and Stephen will be talking about the developed country perspective. So um, um, I think we'll have a good conversation for the next um, 42 minutes. Um, all right, so um, I, I'd like to start uh, with a general question which is, um, you know, apart from regulation, what are the most important factors which lead city decision makers to choose to set up long-term and large-scale composting programs in their cities? Um, Chris, do you, do you want to go first? Yes, I can, yes. So uh, from my experience, um, besides regulations, it's often the pressure of, of filling up landfills or fill of, of kind of expired landfills or not enough landfill space which kind of is the driver to make municipalities think of some some recycling activities, and especially the organic waste, because uh, one has to remember in, in a developing country context, it's it's more than half of the half of the waste generated is is organic waste, so biodegradable waste that can go up to up to 90 percent in certain areas. In in Indonesia, for instance, we have cases it's 85 to 90 percent organics. So of course the potential is there. But um, many people don't really know how to take it, how to go about it. But the dr the pressure often comes from from landfill space. Great. And um, talking about um, lack of landfill space, I mean, in developing countries, we all always hear that the landfill is about to close for for a free few years to go. I mean, uh, when I started uh, working in India, uh, we were told that many landfills will close in the next two to three years, and then after all these years, I mean, it's just, just you know, the landfills are kind of forgiving in that sense. They 
kind of keep on taking waste for, for a longer term. And um, uh, Stephen, um, what are the factors in um, developed countries or in the UK? Let's say? Now, I think historically, if you looked at organic waste as it was, we had the, the sort of the food waste being chucked into the street, and you also then had the fecal matter being you know thrown into the street um, historically, and so you had the the public sanitation issues, which was the the real start. So before the, the sort of the, the reg aspects of regulation, you had this public health requirement um, to sort of what else can we do with it, and we saw the you know, infrastructure being de developed in terms of sewage treatment, etc., to take some of that away. Um, and I think again, more latterly, there, there's been Know, this this requirement well landfills are not necessarily the best place for it um, issues of, of greenhouse gas emissions from it landfill space running out uh, climate change you know perspective uh, involved as well and also some of the, the perhaps the wider sustainability issues about soil health um, the, the use of non you know non sustainable peat in horticulture which is has led to you know it's a drive to to use other renewable resources such as garden waste or food waste and even um, wastewater sludges in a, in a better way to get a, a higher level of benefit. So that's helped you know, in a non-regulatory way encourage the, the use of, of composting. Mm -hmm. So um, in developed countries, I mean, um, the, the decision making kind of comes from the citizens where they're more willing or they're looking at sustainability in uh, aspects and also at alternatives to landfill, but when when we're talking about developing countries, it's kind of a necessity. Like um, it's like a neck, um, it's a knife on on your neck. You know, you have to move towards other alternatives, and that's why composting. That that's interesting. Do you have anything to say about that, Chris? Yes, that's exactly what you say. I mean, um, often, of course, there's also pressure from citizens, and that's changing. You know, that where the environmental sustainability, these ecological aspects, come into play, but really. Um, I, I don't think it's making that an, enough pressure to make municipal municipalities change. It's really the pressure that they need to do something about their their smelling landfills and their landfills which are full. They can't find new landfills because their the landfills are so badly operated and have such a bad track record that no one wants them n near them. So so in a way they're kind of stuck in there. That's why they're kind of searching for whatever alternative comes into their path. Uh, be it a company that is promising some golden bullet to solve all their salute, all their problems, which often doesn't work out, of course, and and the kind of backdrop, kind of the plan B or the kind of um, status quo is composting is kind of accepted as a as a state of the art knowledge um, that you can kind of fall back onto as a first, I would say, less complicated and and easy technological solution to kind of try to solve some of your problems. Mm -hmm. And um, Stephen, do you have any remarks on that? No, I, I think it's very much as, as Chris says. It's, um, you know, it's uh, in the developing sector, you've very much got to take it piecemeal, step by step. You can't go from you know, the, the, the first step or the first stage for you know, better waste management and go straight to a, you know, stage five. You need to take those steps. And, and composting in its different forms is a Know, a practical way of, of delivering that with very beneficial results and indirect beneficial results as well um, and is a you know, doesn't require some of the high technology or technical input to say um, thermal waste treatment for example so it allows you to build that knowledge as you go along which is extremely important we need to provide the infrastructure to, to this to be delivered so you've got to do it you know step by step in a logical way Mm -hmm. um, um, I agree, and um, uh, when um, people talk about solutions, I mean, uh, uh, they kind of forget to realize that it's a system which evolves with, you know, every small input, and then you have the final system that you see in developed countries these days, so great. And um, well, moving on to the next question, and um, uh, when we talk about setting up a long-term and large-scale composting operation for a city, um, what kind of logistics should be? we be discussing and how do they impact the overall program? I mean, Chris, I know um, you, you wanted to talk about what do we do with the compost, I mean, the, the market for compost. Do you, do, do you want to talk about that and that and other logistics? Yes. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Um, I mean, what I, from my experience, what I see is that often munici municipal officers are kind of blended by this vision of composting solving all their problems. And you know that it's a money-making business, and and they're the waste, uh, gold from waste, and all this. 
I mean, with composting, that usually doesn't work out. I mean, markets for compost are not often not well developed or even not even taken care of when thinking about composting as an option. Um, you know, and then, and it's also difficult because farmers are not necessarily in the city, so you have a large transport issue of getting the compost back out into the agricultural areas. So there's a kind of a disparity there. And I think it's just important to, I mean, before starting up, to kind of think, what are you going to do with it? And I'm, I'm okay with not expecting profits um, but it's somehow you need to make sure that then your operations are, are financially sustainable. And sustainable does not mean getting money, enough revenues to, ma to cover all the costs from the sales of, of compost, but it means having a financial system in place. Either you get it from the municipal budget. I mean, it's, it's a part of waste management as well, and it should be seen as that. I think that's, that's kind of one element which I see as, as a kind of a mindset is very important. And then what I always, what I always recommend is you know, to start off with the low-hanging fruit in a way, to not start off, because ideally you want, you want to source segregated um, organic waste to compost. Um, you don't want to start sorting, it gets very complicated and the you, you lose a lot of quality um, in the compost when you have mixed waste. So what you want to do is you want to have a uh, well so, uh, source segregated comp um, uh, raw waste, a feedstock, and of course then go for the go for those waste generators which are already producing that. You know, um, food processing industry, vegetable markets, uh, restaurants uh, could also be a source. Rather than you know targeting household waste. Um, from the start, which is the most complex part of the whole system, because getting people to segregate at the house, I mean, that would be nice as a vision, but that needs a, a significantly more. So starting with the easy waste, uh, nicely already biologically 100% um, or just about 100% uh, biodegradable, and then working and gaining experience on that for the operations um, is a kind of a good approach to take. Mm -hmm. And um, there are multiple points there uh, we could discuss, which I'll get to in next questions. But um, Stephen, could you talk about logistics when planning for such a large-scale operations in cities? Yeah, as, as as Chris was saying, you've got the the key. You know, the first key issue is, is how do you collect this? And you know, we see in developing countries there's very poor, generally very poor infrastructure for collecting. We have an informal sector which you see on, on the recycling side because there's value in those materials so you see that um, you know, being formed but it, it can be very difficult to implement a you know, collection system to, you know, citywide in, in some of the, these areas so it's as Chris was saying how do you collect it so you need to be very specific in terms of where you're targeting it from you then need to look at how you're getting it to the actual treatment plant the composting facility and then the, the final part of that jigsaw and you know it's just as important is where is it going afterwards and how do you get it there? You know, and we've seen in the States, for example, um, where we've had the treatment of sewage sludge and, and being composted or digested, that's actually taken by train from the East Coast you know, into the, the heart of the agricultural areas and, and put that way. We see in the UK and, and other parts of Europe, you know, it will go a significant distance on, on road transport, but it, it's better if you can get it near the, the point of, of use. You don't want to be having you know, lots of logistics um, you know, taking it to the plant and then taking it from the plant. So it's trying to then put your facility in the correct place to minimize that, that amount of, of logistics and understanding that the end market that surrounds you. So is it going to be agriculture? Can it be used as part of you know, greening the cities and, and perhaps sort of smaller scale and um, high value agriculture within a city or horticulture within a, within a city context, depending on what you're doing? So it needs very much to be part of that integrated solution. Doing it by itself will just mean it will, uh, as Chris says, that you know, it won't work economically. You're not going to make it work on selling the product. It's not high value enough. You've got to have it as part of your infrastructure and make it economical, not a white elephant. Mm. And um, um, I wanted to also talk about the quality of compost, but um, uh, I'll, I'll uh, ask Chris about that. But before that, um, uh, Stephen, I'd like to ask you, um, are cities in the developed world or in UK, let's say, uh, are they, what's the trend when it comes to compost, setting up composting programs? 
Um, if, if we go back 10 years, the, the big trend was to collect garden waste. That's a, a very you know, straightforward uh, material to collect. That was separated by the householder. That was then sent to open windrow composting, so composting done in the open, very simple. But since then, we've had um, increased planning regulations, so to minimize impacts from things like odor and bioaerosols. We've had issues over animal health. So we've got very stringent regulations in terms of, of protecting animal health through the animal byproducts regulations, which have a, a direct impact on how we can compost or treat food waste. So what we've generally seen is that over that sort of the last 10 years, we're moving from the simpler open windrow composting to much more sophisticated and more expensive enclosed systems of composting. And more recently, we're seeing the anaerobic digestion you know, take off in, in a much larger way. So we've seen a rapid progression in terms of the development of the market for the type of technology used. Mm -hmm. That all comes at, at a cost, and, and it's about understanding the, the economics of, of collecting it, treating it, and what you're doing with the, the output. So, you know, from composting as a soil, um, you know, a soil improver, we're now using anaerobic digestion to generate you know, biogas for electricity and heat. So it's moved very much from, from one sector into another. So we need to bear that in mind. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. And um, I'll, I'll get back to um, the orders and NIMBY in the next question, but Chris, um, uh, would you like to um, talk about the quality of compost and the value for it? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of discussion on, on having source segregation, of course, and having pure compost because the moment you have mixed, mixed waste, which, which could even work economically sometimes if you then sort it um, you know, manual labor is very cheap in developing countries, so even a manual sorting process, of course, you can still then use the biodegradables to 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 um, to compost. But the, of course, the risk is much higher that you miss things, you have toxic substances, and your quality degrades. And of mm -hmm. course, you're already having problems convincing people to to pay some money for compost, um, or you want to give free away of charge. But anyway, the the, the awareness on the quality, of course, is a big issue. And the moment the quality is not is not good, or the people experience uh, a bad quality compost, then your then the whole the whole approach, the whole system is in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. And it, it's very very difficult to get back the trust um, in compost once it's destroyed. Then you know maintaining it. I think that's that's a very critical issue. Yeah. Um, I mean I'm. In general, just maybe to, to follow up on what Stephen was saying, you know, on the level of strategies, I mean, I'm very much for looking at different levels. I mean, here we're talking now about city-scale large composting. I think, um, I think as a strategy, as a master plan in cities of developing countries, you also have to think about household composting, neighborhood composting, of course, because whatever you can do at that level, um, of course, you're really reducing your waste flow. That means logistics. That means transport costs. And of course, you can build that into a awareness environmental program um, in neighborhoods. You know, so it has a lot of spin-off benefits. That does not mean that you can forget about it about the large scale, because as I said, you have larger sources of organic waste, which you also need to find some solutions. So, so there's enough waste there to also to also use the level of city scale. Uh, large composting site. Mm -hmm. And um, Chris, um, in the next question, I'll ask you about um, uh, examples of um, composting um, and what they're doing to make themselves financially sustainable and also yeah. to sell the compost. Uh, but um, uh, coming back, Stephen, so um, uh, let's talk about, uh, you said NIMBY was a biggest yeah. problem for composting um, So and odors. So uh, what could we do in the planning process um, or during operations so that, you know, that, that could be avoided? Um, I think it, it's very much about you know, putting the, the right system in, in the right place. There's no, you know, it'll be very difficult in highly urbanized areas now to put a, you know, open facility next door to, to you know, large amounts of, of housing or offices, etc., where, where you've got people on a, on a con constant basis because they don't want to be you know, impinged by that odor or the potential of bioaerosols, etc., on them um, or dust from the operation. So it's about finding the, the right location, uh, and that for this large scale, then operation is generally going to be out of the, the urban areas in more rural, less populated areas, 
and perhaps even then putting the, the right type of technology. So you know, open systems may not be appropriate in all, all locations. So you're then looking at putting a you know an enclosed system in place to prevent odors from escaping, to prevent bioaerosols from escaping, to prevent dust, to prevent noise, all of those other um, impacts that, that are there you know, in whatever scale you do it on, on the local population. So it comes down to the right location, the right technology, um, and the right solution. But also it's very important to engage with that community, you know, with the planning community, with the, the local authority, the municipality there, and very importantly with the local community. So they fully understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, and, and how you're going to address their, their fears. You know, you're not always successful in doing that, and you won't always get a, a planning application through. But the more you engage, the more you work with your community, then generally the better the outcome and the better the solution. Mm -hmm. And uh, before we go to the previous questions, um, I have one uh, clarification that I need from um, you, which is um, uh, when talking about technologies and comparing them, um, I've heard multiple times about uh, um, the the contaminants during um, generated during the process of composting or after in the compost. And um, Chris, I, I'd like you to um, address um, you know heavy metals in compost. Do they actually um, you know transport back into the food, or is it much more foggier or you know vague? The, the science in that part is it much is it set or what do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think. There's always the issue of of um, uh, of contaminants. I think for um, farmer acceptance or agricultural acceptance, it's often more glass plastic, which is which is um, the contaminants which they don't like to have in in their and so heavy metals is not something you see, right? So it's it's not something which kind of creates a lot of mistrust. Um, of course, it's it's an issue of soil contamination. Um, I don't know very much about the details of which metals transfer into plants. Uh, I think a lot of metals are also um, quite stable in the soil, but they accumulate over time, so you're actually getting a very highly loaded um, soil. So I, I definitely wouldn't, wouldn't recommend that also from a soil protection um, aspect. Mm -hmm. So um, um, I think um, it, the last I heard about it is the science in the, on that aspect is the, uh, I mean, uh, it d depends. Uh, the take up of heavy metals also depends upon the species of the plants, and uh, it also, I think, uh, depends upon how much water you're putting on the land, and you know, uh, pH, the transportation. Yeah. yeah, if if you've got you know, pH is, is a big driver in whether metals are, are soluble or stable. So if you go either more acidic or more alkali, then generally those metals will become more um, transportable and will move about within within the soil. They're in a solution, so. They're more able to be taken up. So it's about you know, understanding what you're doing. Again, you wouldn't put certain materials onto, say, restoration sites that, that have that are quite acidic already from from the activity that's gone on there previously. You've got to stabilise them, and it, it this comes down to again having a you know a full understanding and risk-based approach and scientific rigour. In it's not just this material you've got. It you've got to think of the long-term impacts and its benefits, and and properly risk assess it and make sure it is suitable and fit for purpose for its use. Great, and um, um, and would you also uh, be able to address the um, aspect of um, production of dioxins? I mean, I'm I'm not sure about this, which is why I'm asking this question. Which is, I heard that composting also produces dioxins. I mean, can any one of you talk about that? Not that I know of, right, okay. uh, Ranjit. Um, I think what is the what is the most critical and what is seen often in literature. Is um, is the the spores the, the from the fungi, uh, which with the dust of course are in the air and and cause um, respiratory infections. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think that's that especially for the workers that's one of the one of the risky um, risky issues. Yeah, okay. that's the, and that that's the bioaerosol issue that I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. So you have this this bioaerosol and it's again it's prevalent if you're in an agricultural area if you're you know harvesting crops etc. You get a lot of bioaerosols produced as part of that and it's again understanding the type of bioaerosols that you're getting produced and the, the levels that, that are there and then how you can minimize that that exposure risk and you know it, it comes into the same the same effect you could be hoovering at home and you're generating bioaerosols and 
Again, we're not generally aware of that, but we take this much more cautious and scientific approach to these processes, which is correct, to make sure they are safe and then mitigating those measures when, when they're not safe. So, you know, in a way that's actually very, you know, very good in that we're starting to understand these type of, of risks and protect people from them, whereas in other sectors they're not understood um, and they're not being raised and not being dealt with. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. And um, I'm sorry about the dioxins question. I, I, I had to ask because I, I heard about it and I just wanted to clarify it. Um, I think it will be useful for others too. And um, and Chris, uh, would you like to talk about the examples in developing countries where they're doing a good job? And later yes. on, yeah, you can also address any other issue. Un unfortunately, there are not so many. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of bad examples, but, but there are a few good ones. And I um, just to mention a few. I think um, there's one very, very prominent example, which is from Bangladesh, from Dhaka, um, in the, the capital, um, where Waste Concern is an organization that is operating a, quite a large facility, and they're, they're, they're composting vegetable waste from the markets. So again, a, a quite a, a, pure, a pure stream. And what I think is quite exciting, of course, it, it's, it's window composting. Um, and what is exciting is that they're linking it to uh, to the agricultural extension services. So they're through a fertilizer company. They're actually distributing the compost, amending it, enriching it with even with chemical fertilizer for different for different crops, and then selling it through this whole distribution network of of agricultural services. Uh, through the, into, into the whole country, of course, because that distribution network already exists, and so they just tap into there. I think that is that is really exciting. Um, what is also interesting is that they were the ones that developed the methodology for the UNFCC, so uh, carbon trading issue. So um, in the developing country context, you actually can use composting as a methane mitigation option. So in practice, CO2 mitigation, um, because uh, the baseline assumption is that in the in the landfills, uh, methane is generated because it's an aerobic process and methane is not captured. So whatever organic waste you divert from the landfill and you compost aerobically, producing CO2 and not methane, that's what that difference is actually what you can credit. As, as a carbon credit and and through that process of course you also get an additional income into your into your system so that's one example another example maybe worth mentioning is from Indonesia from Bali um, similar structure quite a simple composting system it's what what is called table composting so it's large windrows which are actively aerated uh, with blowers and and there the compost is then sold uh, mostly to the uh, tourism industry, which of course in Bali is is, is very large and is wealthy, <laughs> and of, of course they have a lot of parks and gardens in their in their hotels, um, so that's where then they apply the compost in their in their parks, and that and that seems that system is also working uh, economically um, sustainably, but it's also getting credits uh, through these carbon trading mechanisms. Maybe that's good for now, just these two examples, I okay. guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, Stephen? Um, I think there's a, obviously in the developed side there, there are a lot of good examples and best practice you know, around the, the globe, going from Australia through Europe to, to North America. So um, I think it's very difficult to pick out one, but I think the, you know, where we've seen some good examples is where it's really pushed the boundaries in terms of how you know, the, the compost is used. So for example, you know, 10 years ago in the UK, we had a lot of, of peat being used in, in a very large horticulture and retail sector for, for home users in their gardens, and we've seen a dramatic shift away from that, and the you know, compost being used in terms of you know, high-value horticulture by professional growers, they would never have, have used it before, and being used by the likes of you and me on our gardens. You know, we've become very much more in, in touch with, with that side, with the environmental concerns. Um, so we're sort of seeing some of this go, you know, full circle, and we're generating it, and now using it back on our garden. So I think the, you know, the, the developed world, there are many examples of where we've got good collection systems, very good segregation, and 
we've got good examples of, of technology from very simple to very advanced mm. and we're now seeing you know, more advanced and better uses of, of that compost at the back end to replace non-renewable resources, to help improve soil health. We know that you know, the, the level of intensity we have on our agriculture is reducing the, the viability of our soils. So by putting materials like compost back on or, or sludges, we're actually helping to improve the long-term health and sustainability of that. And I think that's where you know where we'll be moving to, especially in the developed side, is we've got that infrastructure there. It's about how we use it, how we derive more value from using that material. And and secondly, it's about sharing that best practice. It's no good, you know, one or two places having this good practice. We need to make sure it's shared across the developed, the developing world, and, and it's passed out as much as possible. We want to lift everybody up. So it's about sharing that that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, Stephen, later on I'll ask you about um, comparing um, AD um, anaerobic digestion with this. Um, but um, Chris, I have two quick questions for you. Um, uh, one is, um, the, we were talking about the quality of compost and the need for segregation. Um, so the first question is, um, how, how much time does uh, society need um, to, you know, start segregating and then segregate in a... Um, significant volume. Um, I know it's difficult, um, but uh, that's one question. And the, the second question is, um, you, you were talking about carbon credits. So um, does the um, uh, current model also include the carbon which is sequestered in the compost? Um, there is some carbon in the compost. So yeah, mm -hmm. go, go for it. Okay. Um, so for your first question on the awareness and kind of building this public perception and time. collaboration you know, in, over time. I think uh, there are different models. It can go quite fast. It depends what incentives you use. Mm. I mean, uh, typically the financial incentive is often the one that that um, has a lot of impact quite quickly. Uh, as soon as it, it affects your wallet, then people start reacting, right? Mm. Um, so so there are there are experiments where you can kind of get financial benefits in a way uh, in developing countries, what is used a lot is these waste banks, you know, bringing segregated waste to a certain place where you then get a, a, some, some credit, whatever it be, either be in materials, in soap, in, in coupons for buying food, or even in um, um, airtime on mobiles. So these are kind of all these different incentive schemes. And they can actually, I mean, that can be implemented quite fast. Mm -hmm. Now, on, and it, but I think to really kind of get ingrained into our system uh, as as a as a practice as a habit, I think it definitely needs a, a generation. So okay. if we if we would start working with children, schools, you know, and really kind of building it into their system that waste is, is segregated, um, then they will do it also without incentive. Maybe when they're grown up. Mm -hmm. uh, but but at the but at the moment we can already kind of initiate that through such different incentives and which don't know necessarily only have to be economic which can also be social uh, mm -hmm. you know the kind of the, the social cohesion social peer pressure is also things that can work quite well um, and you have to kind of develop that in on on a neighborhood level or on people that know each other it usually works better mm -hmm. and uh, about the carbon credits. Oh, on the carbon credits, um, actually, uh, as far as I know, you know, the carbon stored is not, is not considered, but what could be considered is um, the substitute for fertilizer, because to produce fertilizer, uh, especially nitrogen fertilizer, of course, it needs a lot of energy. Uh, that energy, you're, you're, if you're substituting fertilizer, you're avoiding that energy consumption, so you could actually credit that element into your into the use of compost, but mm -hmm. then you would probably have to also prove that it's actually being used. Mm -hmm. um, at the mo the the methane avoidance uh, issue is really is easy to to monitor and to prove because you actually then you just have to measure how much waste you're n not taking to the landfill anymore, so how much you're processing, and that's and then you can make an easy calculation how much methane you're avoiding. If you wanted if you wanted to do about the fertilizer substitution, then you would actually have to see, you know, what are the people doing with the compost? Are they using it? You'd have to try to monitor that and quantify that so that you can get the credits. Mm -hmm. But it would be possible. That's that's feasible. Okay. So um, change does come in um, generations when we're talking about awareness and behavioral change. 
I think so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I think that kind of works. Um, um, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about millennials uh, being more aware of um, environment and um, the climate change, uh, and actually um, most of their jobs and careers being based on sustainable issues. So I think it did come based on the awareness which was started a generation yeah. ago. So. I definitely think so, yeah. Yeah, and, and Stephen, um, comparison with AD, um, I know uh, you, you said AD is the latest trend in developed yep. countries, and any other remarks? Um, yeah, in terms of, you know, we've moved from, I'll call it lower cost open composting to now having a lot of anaerobic digestion in place, which is much higher um, cost and much higher technology, but you get different benefits. It's generating biogas, so we're actually getting electricity and heat so we're talking about now energy security um, in terms of improving that. It could be gas directly injected into gas grids um, to improve, or it could be through the use of the electricity and the use of heat in local heat networks. So we're, we're sort of starting to see that, that gradual change um, in terms of what the, the benefits of this material are. It's not just about making a, a soil improver or, 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 that, or that very you know, one-dimensional approach. Different materials have different benefits and different different uses. So again, it's still really trying to put the right technology down in the right place. Um, anaerobic digestion isn't right for every occasion, isn't right for everything, the same as, as composting isn't. It's about getting that right mix of, of technologies. Um, so that's that's where the difference is. It's now you know the, the incentives we had in place within the UK and within Europe, um, we're seeing a you know we're seeing that the, it's allowed the development of those industries. Um, and so that's why we you know We've managed to, to create those, and, and they play now a vital part. So, but it's having that right balance. Again, don't put the wrong thing in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. um, a small digression, but um, um, Stephen, um, I heard uh, Germany is um, at the cutting edge in AD. Um, yep. Comments? Um, yeah, no. Germany has been at the sort of the front leading edge of, of AD for a long time, um, okay. and we're seeing. You know, we're seeing AD. A lot of the, the technology providers used throughout Europe and other places have got German origins. Um, they've moved there more quickly. They had the right incentives in place, and they've got both large-scale facilities and you know smaller on-farm scale facilities. And that's what we're starting to see in the UK. We've got larger centralized ones and these smaller, you know, sort of one megawatt, half a megawatt size facilities that are generating stuff on the farm. And again, it's having that right mix. One size doesn't fit all. As Chris said. You know, earlier on in the in the panel discussion, you're not going to get a silver bullet to, to fix all of these, these problems. You've got to have you know a range of tools and a range of solutions. Great. Um, well, we haven't had enough discussion about anaerobic digestion on uh, on B waste wise, but we hope to have that in future. And uh, maybe we can have you and uh, Luca Arso, my very good friend from GBB, on uh, on again. Um, um, but when it comes to small scale AD, um, I think India has a lot of activity uh, in that. Um, in, in small scale AD, so that's interesting. And um, moving on to the um, next question, um, Chris, uh, we, we have only another um, seven minutes. So, what are your main takeaways from um, you know working with composting programs, and uh, how does um, composting fit with recent trends um, like urban farming or hydroponics? Or, yeah. Or, Okay, so I mean, my, my, we, we used to work on composting, we also moved into anaerobic digestion onto AD, um, and I think what we need to realize is that composting, the, the value of the compost is usually quite low. So any technology uh, where we can try to get more value from our waste, of course, is interesting, but of course with the drawbacks that it might be, as Stephen was saying, might be more complex in terms of technology. So we all really have to look what is the most suitable, most practicable approach in the local context, depending on that local situation, economic situation, and the, the, the demand for those different waste-derived products. Um, of course, I'm very much as a, I think we need to think about multiple levels. I think I'd like to just stress that again, you know, work at household level, at neighborhood level, but also at city level because involving the people kind of also builds their trust and acceptance for such projects, you know, if they're doing it at home, they can also understand what a central facility is actually doing and what the benefits are. So, kind of bringing those different stakeholders together to push forward in the compost. And composting is really the simplest, simplest approach to take. So, it's a kind of a, a, a easy entry point into this organic waste management. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And uh, composting, I mean, the process itself is um, happening all the time everywhere around the world. And, yeah. um, and exactly. um, I think it's very simple, but the scaling of it kind of uh, makes it more complex. But um, I understand we, we should look at it at different levels, um, you know, decentralized and centralized levels. Yeah. And um, um, Stephen, what are your takeaways um, working with composting programs and uh, um, how, do they, how does it fit with uh, recent trends? Urban I think hydroponics. I think the biggest one is to to think about it in in a holistic and integrated way. So don't just think about the collection or the treatment or the use. You need to think about it in that in that virtuous circle. What do you you know? Ultimately, you need to start with how are we going to use the finished material? What are we going to do with it? What's its most beneficial use? And then work back through. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a solution that perhaps doesn't fit, doesn't work, does you know is too expensive, etc. You've got to cover it from that that end perspective and link it all together. So that's my my biggest one. There's been too much, you know, partial thinking. We'll just think about collecting, or we'll just think about treatment. You need to think all about all of it at the start of the process. So you've got a fully defined solution, and it fits with your particular situation. And again, there's no one silver bullet. It's about putting the right solution in the right place. One size doesn't fit all. Great, and um, talking about silver bullets, I mean, um, we've had a lot of lots of jokes about these, but I, I think it is a real problem in many countries where um, people are promised silver bullets, and um, kind of they don't um, uh, just doesn't uh, happen. And um, so finally, we have only four minutes to go, and um, I would like to remind all our viewers that um, we have a survey. So just like uh, we we chose the topic this year based on a survey we conducted last year, so we're conducting another such survey for choosing topics for next year, and um, it'd be wonderful if you could um, uh, you know go go to our website, find the survey, and fill the survey. Um, um, we actually take suggestions very seriously, and we actually put all of them together, see which are the most discussed topics, and then we choose topics based on that. Um, great. So finally, um, Chris and Stephen, um, do you have any concluding remarks, or what would you say to the viewers, Chris? Okay. Thanks. Um, well, thanks for for this panel. I think it's very interesting. Uh, maybe one last remark I would like to just make to our, to the people that are watching is that we're currently developing a, a course on municipal solid waste management, which is an online course. It's a free course. It'll be on on the Coursera platform. Uh, what are these called? These MOOCs, M-O-O-C, uh, Massive Open Online Courses. And it's specifically geared toward municipal solid waste management in developing countries. So um, the launch is expected to be in February, and of course it's free of charge, so um, the more that attend, the, the more fun it will be. We'll have a forum where we can also chat and discuss. So we're looking forward to a lot of uh, registered participants. Great, wonderful. And um, um, talking about a course, um, um, Chris, uh, we've been planning on a course for a while now. So I, I think um, it'll be interesting for us to talk after this panel. Definitely, um, yes. Great. And um, um, you know Sanjay Gupta, he was on one of our panels. and um, Yes, he's, he's giving an input uh, in our course as well. Right. So um, he's yeah. Already he, pla- he's a planned as a lecturer. <laughs> right, and um, he, he was the one who tipped me off on uh, the EWOC course <laughs> okay. while we were at Israel well last, last month. Um, 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 Stephen, concluding remarks? Yeah, thank you very much. And I think it's been another um, really interesting discussion. And I think if, you know, if a municipality or, or an urban area is thinking about going down this route, thinking about what they need to do, then speak to, to other people that have done it, speak to companies like Ricardo and others, that have you know wide knowledge of, of what may work and what and what may well not work to help them put in place the right solution. Um, it's about sharing this knowledge and actually you know tailoring the requirements for their particular needs. It's don't just do you know think I must buy this most expensive piece of technology. Actually look at the available options and, and think about it carefully. Think about all of the aspects and think about the long term. Great. Thank you very much, um, both um, Chris and Steve. Stephen. Um, so um, again, um, thank you again um, to the uh, community for uh, joining us today. And if you're watching this panel after the broadcast, um, you can find all other panel discussions on our archives page. And again, uh, we have a survey, and um, your inputs will be um, greatly appreciated. Um, uh, you can actually, with your inputs, help shape the next global dialogue on this. So thank you very much, and um, see you next Wednesday with Zoe Lankovic talking about 
engaging communities for better waste management. Thank you.